Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week. The Silver Coin, number one, from Image Comics. This issue is written by Chip Zdarsky with artwork by Michael Walsh. So this is the first part of a new horror anthology. So it's going to be an anthology series with a different creative team on each issue. And it's all going to be revolving around this silver coin that has some kind of supernatural capabilities. In this debut issue, which is expertly written by Chip Zdarsky, seriously, the dialogue, I used to think that Chip was overly verbose at times. That's all been ironed out over the last several years. The artwork by Michael Walsh is really great. I love the coloring. I love the grit and textured nature of the story. The coloring is also done by Walsh, as well as the letters. This book was really well done. So it's about a musician, a guitar player in a band, and they're just kind of, this is set I guess in the 70s and this band's just been kind of playing the same club over and over again. Disco wave is coming on, everybody's pressuring them to go more dancey, to go more disco, and their crowds are just dwindling and dwindling away week to week, month to month, year to year. Then they find this silver coin and he uses it one day because he can't find his guitar pick and all of a sudden he just shreds like nobody else and it's the typical rise to fame due to circumstances that are mostly supernatural, um, but a very well done book. So even though it is kind of a common story that we've seen played out a few times, the way that the structure winds the characters' motivations in and out with each other, the way it keeps weaving everything to build up to this climatic end in this story. I absolutely loved it. You're going to have a different creative team next issue. It's going to be Kelly Thompson. Jeff Lemire's doing one. This is definitely one to look out for. I loved it. All of these stories, I think it's five, maybe six issues. I don't know, but the next issue is done by Kelly Thompson. Hey, and look at that, Michael Walsh. So it's the same artist, I guess, throughout each issue. Same artist, different writer, but all revolving around the silver coin. And I'm anticipating most of the stories are going to jump time periods. I really like this. If you are a fan of horror, especially horror in comic books, I would highly recommend you uh, to check this out. If you've been following Chip Zdarsky's career, this is one of his best scripts in a while. And he's been doing some really great scripts. So the silver coin, number one, that's the pick of the week. Also from Image Comics, we've got Geiger, number one. This is the debut brand new creator-owned book from Jeff Johns and Gary Frank. That's the exact same creative team of Doomsday Clock. Some book, I've never really heard of it. I don't know. What is it? What's a backlog, bro? Anyway, Geiger number one is really, really solid. I liked it. So, since they have worked on a Watchmen-type project, there are lots of elements there. So, Jeff Johns is weaving all of this uh, information through the story, through background noise, through news programs. There's a lot of semblances, or resemblances, I should say, to his work on Doomsday Clock, to... Um, you know, his tribute to the Watchmen there. Same with Gary Frank, but still doing a different thing. So that feels very rigid and structured, like a Watchmen book, but it's got bigger, more explosive moments. But that being said, this doesn't feel like a Watchmen book. It just uses some of the same techniques that Johns has developed in tributing to the Watchmen in the book Doomsday Clock. Um, Geiger was really cool, but it's about uh, the bad the bad stuff finally happens and nuclear war erupts and everything just gets wiped out. And now this is 20 years later, the remnants of humanity, but there are these rumors of this one dude who they call the glowing man, who walks alone out in the desert, who's not affected by radiation, who doesn't have to wear a suit. Who is it? This is a little bit more of a superhero concept brought back to image, but by Jeff Johns and Gary Frank. I had a lot of fun with this issue. A great setup, some really impactful emotional moments, and all in all, a great setup for what's to come. Geiger number one, pretty solid. Noctera number two is here. I was really rather blown away by issue one. Um, a really cool concept. Basically what happens is all the light goes away, right? The sunlight goes and it's just all gone and the earth is enveloped in darkness. Right, But if you're exposed to the darkness for long enough, you start mutating into some kind of wild animal, some kind of crazy monster. Right, 
So this is about a group of people. They've managed to survive by keeping themselves lit, by wearing lights on themselves. They, they, they get this like convoy of truckers and they go around and they're trying to save people, help people, make money, things like that, right? So it's a crazy cool concept, but it was really grounded with some really great character work. That continues on by Scott Snyder here in issue number two. And just like I said about issue number one, this is some of the best Tony S. Daniel artwork I have seen ever. And I think it's because he's got time to work on. It feels fleshed out. It feels refined. Tomomori's coloring definitely helps that as well. The second issue, though, does a great job of getting us to the next point in the story where some of the people have to make certain decisions to decide which path they're going to go on into the duration. Plus, we get introduction into one of the villains of the piece, which I think is really nifty and super cool. Noctera number two, really, really liked it. And since I talked about the artwork... I freaking love this book. The artwork, seriously. Like, Tony Daniels sometimes, depending on how often, how, how behind he is, I guess, on a deadline and, and who his inker is, um, it can go either way. But I will say that this is some really, really solid work from Tony Daniels. Then we got Firepower here with issue number 10. Um, a really great issue. This book has been dealing with the calm before the storm for a few issues now, and the storm erupts in issue number 10 of Firepower, and I'm very, very excited. We are set for a giant, giant martial arts battle with lots of cool mysticism and all that kind of stuff. All the pieces have been put into place. The final um, movements are made here in issue number 10, and then it just erupts. I'm having a lot of fun with this one. Robert Kirkman is telling a story that's not just about people talking. You know, like, I like what Robert Kirkman's work, but it seems like a lot of the time it's just people talking, and even maybe that's the case here in Firepower, but because of Chris Samney and Matt Wilson on the, uh, on the artwork, it's got this great dynamic flow and pace throughout that I just think is expertly done, and I'm enjoying this book so much. This is just such a fun comic book, and I love just sitting down and enjoying it. Firepower number 10 out this week. Let's jump over to Marvel, because Marvel's got the King in Black number 5. This is the final issue. The long-awaited run ends. King in Black from Donny Case, Ryan Stegman. Um, it was all right. It was pretty good. It's kind of the ending that you could project. Like, especially since we've had so much time between issues 4 and 5, if you really started thinking about it, you didn't have to think too long or too hard to really know how this was going to wrap up. So it did a, it did have a predictable ending, though the, it wasn't predictable a while ago in necessarily how it all panned out. We knew the God of Light was going to be this, but who is the God of Light and this and that? Um, all in all, I really did like the ending. I thought it was pretty solid. It didn't feel like it hit the emotional punch of an ending, um, if this is truly like the ending of the entire Kate's Venom era, it doesn't feel like we've quite gotten quite, mm, but I think that's what Venom 200 is for. That's the denouement. That's the, that's the, that's the emotional weight and that's the setup for the next direction. Um, I am excited for what could happen post King and Black, but for the most part, um, it was a pretty solid ending, but it wasn't anything out of nowhere. It wasn't anything surprising. It had some nice big action bombastic moments, and that was cool. But all in all, King and Black was just kind of, I wouldn't say it was disappointing, and I definitely want to sit down and read the whole run all together. I'm talking about Venom, Absolute Carnage, Back to Venom, into King and Black. Read it all, see how it gels. Um, but it seems like it's kind of a a predictable and easy ending. I don't know. King of Black number five, it was good. It was good. Then we got the Venom number 34 tie-in. I read this one after, um, so that may have affected my enjoyment of this one. It's all right. It it deals with some more emotional stuff. That's what we've been talking about. The Venom tie-ins to King and Black have been the ones to deal with more of the actual uh, human story that Eddie's been going through since Venom number one in, what, 20-whatever it was when uh, Kate's first took over. Um, this you could read right before this. This perfectly sets this up. So it actually goes in between. So I should have read this one first, but I didn't. Um, but it was all right. It's pretty solid. And it's going to have an ending that will have major ramifications for certain characters and corners of the Marvel Universe. But Venom um, number 34 was pretty solid. I really come uh, up on Ivan Coelho's artwork. I really liked it here. It's nice. It's nice like 90s spark and sheen and gloss to it, but I really liked it. So Venom number 34, pretty decent. Then we got King of Black, Planet of the Symbiotes number three. There's a cloak and dagger story. There's a toxin story. None of them are super essential. Some of them do some neat things. Um, the jury, or at least the guardsman, kind of makes a return, and that's kind of neat. But all in all, I think the tie-ins 
to King and Black have been some of the weakest tie-ins we've had from Marvel in a while. Um, I don't know if that's true, honestly. Marvel just does weak tie-ins. They really do. Let's just be honest with ourselves. Anyway, King and Black, Planet of the Symbiotes number three. Glad that's all over. King and Black ended satisfyingly enough, but I wish it would have given me one good, one more good, like, you didn't see that coming. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Amazing Spider-Man 63. Um, another solid issue of Amazing Spider-Man. I'm serious. Um, there's a little bit of the kindred stuff in there dangling. It started to annoy me because it comes in first, but then it eases back into a wild, fun, um, weighty uh, interaction with Randy. You know, Randy's been dating the new Beetle or whatever, and and that's kind of erupts a little bit. But you got just you got Spider-Man teaming up with Boomerang. That's that's what I've been loving about the Spencer run is when Boomerang is a focal character. I'm really, really digging it. And when he's not, and when it's just focusing on Kindred and all the, uh, uh, the, 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 the overwrought emotions that Peter deals with due to that, like that kind of bothers me. But when we just get into this nice, fun story that's got a lot of connections to Spidey stories that I've read before, like in the 80s especially. Um, and I mean, I really like this issue. I thought it was good. I thought this was a really good. So that's two issues in a row. Two really good issues of Spider-Man in a row. Don't be fooled, though. Because the Kindred stuff's still just dangling there. And we'll see what happens. Avengers is here with issue number 44. Feels like this, this, this tournament of the Phoenix thing's been going on forever and ever and ever. Maybe it's just because I haven't been that interested into it. But, you know, it is necessary, I guess, with the way that jo uh, Jason Aaron started his run on the Avengers that that it would wind up with some kind of Phoenix thing. Because he's got this idea of all these totems, the Black Panther mantle, the Mjolnir, the Phoenix Force, the Spirit of Vengeance, the Sorcerer Supreme, the Iron... All this stuff. It's all tied together. And you can see how he's bringing it all together into the modern age. So you knew that they would have to get to the Phoenix. But it just feels like the Phoenix is overdone. That being said, we finally get to the end of this damn tournament. And we finally know now who the new Phoenix for the time being will be. It's an interesting choice. I am excited to see where it goes, how it develops. It makes a little bit of sense and it makes a little bit of uh, nonsense. Uh, so all in all, I thought this was an okay issue, but I really feel like we got to be near in the end game for Jason Aaron pretty freaking soon. Avengers 44 was, was okay. Immortal Hulk 45 was freaking awesome. I loved it. Jason... Uh, not Jason, but Joe Bennett back doing just what he does best. Great, terrible, horrific body horror type stuff. Great layouts, intricate panel design at times, and big bombastic panel design when it needs to. But just some really creepy moments. And there's some stuff in there I'm not even showing you that's just like ball to the wall, wild and crazy and cool. Plus, you get like... A new iteration of the Hulk, and it's pretty cool and nifty, and I'm really loving this story. I'm loving the leader's involvement. Um, I do feel like it stretches itself a bit too much sometimes, and it could get to certain points quicker, um, all in all. But this was a great, exciting issue of the Immortal Hulk for me, uh, mostly because I just could stare at some of that Joe Bennett artwork for just days and days and days. Immortal Hulk number 45 out this week. Pretty solid. We got Marauders. Number 19 is here. I'm loving this book, continuing to love this book. There's also an Excalibur, and it's the second one in a row I haven't read. And guess what? I couldn't feel better. But Marauders, I could not skip. I love this book. So right now, the Marauders are dealing with the idea that they helped some people in Matrapur, and now the, the rich elite in Matrapur and the criminal element, well... Let's be honest, almost everybody in Matrapur is the criminal element. Um, but they're like fighting hard now um, against the people that the, the, the Marauders were just helping. We get the Morlocks uh, involved into that, and that's pretty cool. The Marauders can't officially do anything and be seen on the island due to, you know, certain Krakoan um, um, uh, ideas of Krakoan ambassadorship or whatnot. But... Uh, but they find a way, and they are pirates. And this is the X-Men pirate book that I never thought I wanted, um, never knew I needed, and definitely am glad that I have. Marauders number 19. If you've been liking that book, I think you're going to like that one. America Chavez, Made in the USA, issue number two. I've never really been that invested in this character. Um, I enjoy her appearances in books like Young Avengers or West Coast Avengers. Um, I've liked that, but this is digging more into her past, more into her story, and I don't know if it's revealing new information. It seems at least like it 
feels like we're revealing new information about her past, her origins, um, but it all feels real. It all feels cool. It's grounded. Um, it's also fantastical, and I'm actually enjoying this. I thought issue number one was okay, but I was really hooked in with issue number two. It got right to the root of the character, setting up this mystery, building up something, and by the end of it, I'm like, you know... There could have been more of a revealed here to really bring us back to issue number three, but it was enough for me, so I will be coming back. Speaking of coming back, let's go back to DC. And from DC, we have Green Lantern number one. This is the start of the Infinite Frontier, Green Lantern, which is the start of the Jeffrey Thorne run of Green Lantern. Now, Jeffrey Thorne did the main story in the Future State Green Lantern book, and I didn't really dig on that, didn't really vibe on it, so I was really... Kind of not looking forward to this one, and I read it, and I didn't really like it. I mean, honestly, this one, it's okay. It's got some nifty ideas. It's got some decent artwork. Seriously, Dexter Soy on the artwork's probably the best part of this book for me. Um, I love this cat's artwork, like, immensely. It deals with Teen Lantern. It deals really primarily with Jon Stewart. It's got a little bit of Hal. It's got some Guy. It's got some Simon. It's, it's doing a decent job of trying to juggle a, a bunch of different lanterns, and there's this new threat, this new idea, and something happens at the end of this that should be very exciting, but it just doesn't come across that way because the 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 book is just kind of muddied and clunked up by the dialogue, by the story, by some missteps, I think, throughout the narrative. And that's just my take on it. Um, it should be more impactful. With the events that actually happen here, they didn't have the room to breathe. They didn't have the buildup necessary to make them feel significant or or ultra eventful. Um, and the characterization of John Stewart maybe just a little rough. I don't know. But Green Lantern number one didn't really sell me. Didn't really like that one. The next Batman Second Son issue number one. This is the first part of a four part series. This was a digital first series. Now it sees itself here in print. Um, pretty solid. The artwork is all right. It's serviceable. It's Tony Atkins and uh, Travel Foreman. And it does a decent job of just kind of getting the story a point. It doesn't really uh, do anything exceptional to bring you in like a lot of Bat books do, which have a very strong um, artistic vision behind them. Um, the writing by John Ridley, though, is pretty solid. What this is, is this is the story of Jace... Right? This is Luke Fox's son, Tim Fox, but now it's Jace Fox. We're calling him Jace. And uh, this is the story of him returning to Gotham, kind of building more into that background. All the stuff that's kind of been teased here and there, whether it was the Future State Next Batman book or the Detective or Batman books that were building up into it, um, it starts here. So this is primarily focused on him. There's very little superhero action in here there's a little bit of batwing type stuff but this is not a next batman this is not a continuation of that story but it's more like a prelude this is jace's return to gotham his interactions with his family deepening that mystery deepening that tragedy um and i actually really really liked it this the artwork is okay i mean it does enough of a job to get the story and the point across but the story the characterization is where this one really reigns for me, it's not the best book on the shelves. It's by far not the worst. It's pretty solid. I really liked it, and I like this look into the Fox's family. Next, Batman Second Son, number one, out this week. Batman 107 is here. Talk about artistic vision. Jorge Jimenez and Tomo Mori on this book. Holy freaking cow. The artwork in Batman has never been better. The Scarecrow has never looked more scary. I love the dynamic of bringing of Oracle coming back, and she's now the voice in Batman's ear again. You know, you got so used to hearing Alfred, but for the longest time, it was Oracle, so I like that dynamic. I like having that back. I'm a Harley Quinn fan now. All of a sudden, seriously, these Black Label books have done a great job with her character, and in the pages of Batman, they're doing a great job. James Tynan's doing such a fantastic job with these characters, building out this world the art is fire. It's great. We're building into the magistrate stuff, but you know that it's not going to go quite as it did in Future State because that was a possible future because don't forget, we are now in the infinite frontier. Anyway, Batman continues to be solid, and I think James Tynan, I think he came in to do a certain job with the Joker War. It was supposed to be the last Batman Joker story. Then they were going to move to 5G. That didn't happen. The next story felt like it was just kind of thrown together, but there was some setup. All that setup's coming true now, and this really feels like Tynan's finally telling his first full-on, appropriate, ongoing Batman story. All the pieces have been in place. A creepy version of uh, the Scarecrow. Great work with Harley Quinn. Batman is there. Um, great work with Oracle and the mystery deepening and rich 
powerful, colorful, beautiful artwork. Wow. Dynamic as hell. Batman 107. Loved it. Another book I loved, The Swamp Thing, number two of ten. This is a ten-part miniseries, but I do got to say this. Rom V and Mike Perkins, the writer and artist on this book, they have not just these ten issues planned, but they have a season two planned. And not just that, they have a season three planned. Because remember, it's the infinite frontier. So we got to spread the word. If you're loving this book, and I hear a lot of love when we do live streams, when I talk to other YouTubers and other creators and, and just other people in the industry, the word of the shop, people are loving the Swamp Thing book. We got to let everybody know, buy it. Buy the Swamp Thing book. Let DC know, first of all, that you love Swamp Thing and you love Ron B. and Mike Perkins on this book and that you love a $3.99 comic book without an added backup story. By the way, there's a, there's a Ghost Maker backup story in here that's okay. But it's just okay. Um, but the Swamp Thing number two was magnificent, magnificent, continuing on what we were established with in issue number one. But anyway, let buy this book. Let your friends know about it. We got to make sure that we get as many issues of Ron V and Mike Perkins on this book as possible. Issue two was excellent. The artwork is fantastic in this book. It does a great job of being a horror comic book and being cemented to some previous runs in the past, but still having its own identity, which is still truly horrifying. Um, I love it. Um, we're going back to that, that. There's this villain. He's like this dude that was just out in the desert and he started drinking oil and he kind of became like almost like the Swamp Thing of the desert. And you got Levi, who's a new avatar for the Swamp Thing. The mystery that's going on there, it's deepening. The mystery of his personal life, his history, all of it is so delicately balanced in such an expertly in such an expert way by Ron V's script and handled so magnificently well by Mike Perkins, Mike Spicer, I believe. Yeah, Mike Spicer on the coloring and Aditya Bittercar on the lettering. This is just a top-notch horror comic book in a superhero world. The Swamp Thing number two. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it, but it's here. We have it. Suicide Squad number two. I'm really still liking this book. Uh, really, honestly, like shocked. Really shocked. I think it's Robbie Thompson, um, whose work I don't typically always like that much, but the artwork is really good. It's got some energy. It's got some explosive, dynamic, and bombastic bits in it. Um, it's pretty cool. And it's got Superboy involved now. You actually have Suicide Squad members dying. You already... I mean, that usually happens in the first. Oh, you get a little bit of Batman action there, too. So, whatever. But this is set during A-Day when the Joker gas kills all these people in Arkham. And Peacemaker and his Suicide Squad are there. They're after the Talon. Most of that team gets wiped out. Waller brings in a new team. Connor's a part of that team. I'm a big Superboy Connor Kent fan, so I'm excited for that and a new... Uh, journey for this character, but also the iteration of Peacemaker. You know, they're doing something neat with it. I I buy it. I'm excited about it. It feels connected, and there's something about DC Infinite Frontier that feels ultimately very cohesive, connected, and invigorated with with a with a very much a vibrant, youthful energy. You know, like there is something about DC right now that's that's sparking up, and it's not just the cost. It's not just the cost. There's actually the content inside of these books has actually been heating up a little bit. Suicide Squad number two was pretty fantastic. Sensational Wonder Woman number two. So this is a Wonder Woman anthology story or series where each issue is going to be done by a different writer and artist. The first issue was done by Stephanie Phillips. And I can't remember the artist and it was all right. Um, this one was actually way better. Andrea Shea and Bruno Rondondo. This is a really great story that involves Mongol, has some Wonder Woman versus Artemis action, but this was a nice fun and clean one and done Wonder Woman story that also can introduce you to other elements of the DC universe if you're not familiar. So this would be really great if you got a Wonder Woman fan in your life. Say they watch the movies, say they like them, say they watch the Snyder Cut, they love Wonder Woman. Like, well, I want to see a badass Wonder Woman. This is one single issue. You could buy that person, let them read it, and they may really enjoy it and maybe learn something about how awesome comic books are. Sensational Wonder Woman number two, a really solid one and done Wonder Woman story featuring Mongol and Artemis. Now we have Crime Syndicate issue number two. Now that the Omniverse is reborn, resettling in DC, Infinite Frontier. Um, Crime Syndicate, this is Earth 3. This is the evil Justice League world. Um, it's reformed. It's in a new, there's new iterations and versions of these characters, um, which that's exciting enough. And then you got these great covers by Jim Chung. But inside the book, I just do not like it. I did not like the first issue. I like the second issue even less. It felt cluttered. It felt, it felt overwrought. It felt silly. It felt redundant. 
it just didn't do anything for me. In fact, it was rather boring. And for the most part, I was rather annoyed with it. Now, because I get DC books so early, it's really easy for me not to pass up on DC books right now because I get to read them all at once without all the other books in the way. Um, but it's going to be really hard to read another issue of Crime Syndicate. I am not liking that. I'm usually digging everything involved in Earth 3 uh, Crime Syndicate. Then we got The Man Bat number 3. And if you watch Rock and Robbie Live, in which I do the DC sneak peek every Sunday, so that's your first look and my thoughts on the DC books, uh, I didn't cover Man Bat because it was, it was lost in the Swamp Thing stack. Anyway, Man Bat number three, I read it, oh, amazing. Really loving this book. Just a nice, simple Man Bat story with some amazing artwork. Sumit Kumar is the artist from uh, The Savage Shores. The art in this book is freaking fantastic. Like, I love it. In this one, now that he's been captured by the Suicide Squad, he has a nice conversation with Harley Quinn. She's doing her, uh, you know, she's doing her whole uh, psychoanalyzing of him and all that kind of stuff. And I really just, just love the hell out of this book. Man Bat is great. It's a story that's set pre-death metal, so it's got the older Suicide Squad in it. It's not really showing Man Bat as he existed in the Justice League Dark Run by James Tynan and Rom V. Um, but it's, I guess, telling us the bridge of that story. It's Man Bat at his wits end, at the last bit. What's he going to do? He's becoming more monstrous. He's ostracized himself away from everybody in his life, from his community. Um, but I'm loving it. It's just a really great book. I would not have thought that three out of five issues into a man book series, I would still be so hype on it. But seriously, with Kumar's artwork... It's hard not to be hype about it. The Dreaming, Waking Hours, issue number nine. Um, this issue, I hate this term, so I'm not going to say that this issue was filler because it does give us a little bit of information about a few characters that we didn't have already. But for the most part, especially nearing the end of its run, it felt like we weren't building up so much as just kind of calming down and arresting our laurels. Now, maybe that makes sense with some of the events that are going on because Ruin and his, his troop are are being uh, distracted in a very Siren-esque type way from, like, say, the Odyssey or something. And that makes sense, but that's something that should happen earlier in the story, not as we're gearing to an ultimate climax. I have heard rumors that this book is ending relatively soon within the next one to three issues, but they're not acting like it, but that just may be due to scheduling or not understanding exactly how long they have. There's just something about this one that felt like it was just holding back too much when right now what I feel we need in this book is to really start ramping up even further and further. There is some slow ramp up. We're building up to the world about the War of the Fairy, the Fairy King, and we're, we're building up to something that could be really large. Um, but this one just kind of took too much of a step back for me with issue number nine. But I still am um, enamored with that one. The Dreaming Waking Hours issue number nine. Then we have Joker Harley Criminal Sanity number eight. Didn't really dig on this one. This is the final issue. Now, I do remember this being solicited as a nine-issue series. Now, maybe that was the plan, eight issues plus the secret files, but I don't think it was. I feel like this is basically two issues shoved into one, so it doesn't really give anything the room and the weight that it needs to actually have an impactful punch at the end of what has been a very well done story. We're talking about the Joker Harley story by way of something like a 90s psychological thriller, say like Seven, right? Um, and I've been really liking it. I've been really enjoying this version of Harley and even enjoying this way different version of the Joker. As just a no, no, no offense because he does some wild, crazy stuff in here, but he's this isn't this isn't the same Joker. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's a much more tame Joker, even though he's like a serial killer and he like recreates these pieces of art using like human tissue and body parts and stuff, right? Um, but Joker Harley Criminal Sanity just kind of rushed through the ending and it nev didn't have the emotional weight or the narrative punch that this story deserved after a really good buildup. Seriously. Joker Harley Criminal Sanity number eight, final issue. It was just okay. Let's jump to some indies. And we'll start with Boom with Magic the Gathering, number one. So it's a comic book based on the card game Magic the Gathering. But unlike the other ones that have existed, there have been Magic comic books since there's been Magic pretty much. This is Boom Studios. Boom Studios does a pretty good job with their licensed materials. Now, um, there is an A cover, I think, by Matteo Scalera, which looks dope. We got shorted our copy, so I had to get one of the bagged... Planeswalker variants, and I guess it's kind of like the Power Ranger thing where you don't know which Planeswalker you're going to get. I got that one. I don't know who she is. Uh, there you go. I've, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. 
I played Magic for about six to eight months, maybe a year, um, at some point ago. I don't really like letting a lot of people know this. I don't play it anymore. Um, but I, I did get into it for a minute, and the tail end of my experience with Magic was the release of Innistrad or whatever. So I get some, I understand maybe more of this than if you didn't know anything about it. But I'll tell you this, I was rather impressed with this book. It's written by Jed McKay with artwork by Ig Guara, um, coloring by Ariana Cassoni. Um, the artwork is really freaking good in this book. The artwork is really good. It's got great color. It's got great energy. Um, it's got a great pace and flow. It has a crackle and a snap and a pop. If you want to just go ahead and go the whole, you know, crispy, rice, crispy, crispy rice, the whole crispy rice thing, crispy rice, crispy rice. Anyway, Magic the Gathering is actually pretty good. Even if you hadn't, if you don't know anything about Magic, and here's the thing, even though I played Magic. The only benefit that gave me is that I recognized the names of the planes. I recognized the names of the, some of the cities, and I recognized the idea of what a planeswalker is. That's it. I don't know anything about the lore of Magic the Gathering. I never really delved into that or got into that. I know there are books. There's plenty of it, right? But this was actually a really freaking good book. Really. If you like high-energy fantasy, and especially if you like Magic the Gathering... You should check this out because I haven't read every single Magic the Gathering comic book ever, but I've read some of them, um, including the the more recent IDWs. I've even read some of the, was it Dark Horse back in the day? It's nothing like this. The only shame is, why did it come with a card? An exclusive card. An exclusive Magic the Gathering card. It was actually pretty decent. And we also had the Return of Seven Secrets, y'all, with issue number seven. And I loved this issue. Holy crap. So... There was a major, like, major stuff happened at the end of the first arc of Seven Secrets. The artwork, by the way, continues to be dynamic and kinetic and just a great charge throughout it. Um, honestly, the artwork is probably, this might be the best artwork in the series. Um, the coloring is phenomenal. Does the Nikilo do the coloring? No, Walter Biamonte. The coloring in this book is phenomenal. But after the revelations of issue six into issue number seven now, the story has heated up, ramped up, and is now going into uh, territory that I did not think that we were going to go to, and I'm having so much fun with it. Uh, those first six issues were just all build up of the world, the legend, the mythology, and the characters, and now it has just exploded into something vibrant, something gorgeous and something incredibly fun. Seven Secrets number seven by Tom Taylor and company. Wow. Loved that issue. Also from Boom, we have The Last Witch issue number four. The Last Witch issue number four. Um, I'm loving this book. It's freaking good. So it's written by Connor McCreary, VV Glass on the artwork. It's got this light touch. It's a little bit all ages, but it definitely deals with some thematic material that may be tough for super young kids. Um, but more importantly, is dealing with things like grief, loss, tragedy, resiliency, uh, overcoming obstacles, um, all that kind of stuff. And introducing a new character in here, it's got a nice, fun, light approach. This one is a little bit more low-key than some of the other issues. There's not quite as much um, action or adventure in this issue. It's a lot of setup, but it's a lot of setup that's necessary, and I am just enamored and engrossed with this book. A book that I thought issue number one was just okay. Then we got to two, and it's just been getting just so much better. This book is phenomenal, and I'm going to tell you this. It's still $4.99, but it no longer has a really good cover. The, uh, the paper quality did go down on this issue. They're pulling a marvel here with the cover on this one. That kind of sucks, but it is a lot of pages. There's a lot of meat to this one, too. Um, Last Witch, number four. Solid. From Aftershock, we got Project Patron, number one. Um, this is a new one from Steve Orlando and Patrick Piazza Lunga. Piazza Lunga? Anyway, Project Patron was actually really good. I really enjoyed this book. To kind of break it down for you, this is what this book is. Superman and Doomsday are fighting at the beginning. They literally show you the death of Superman. That, that's, that's the image right there when Superman and Doomsday kill each other. And then, of course, they all mourn, you know, funeral for a friend. And then Superman comes back. Of course, this isn't Superman, it's Patron. Now, I don't know exactly what the solicitations say, so I'm not going to spoil it too much. But let me just tell you this. Think of Project Patron if you read the, the Death and Return of Superman stuff. If you read it, think of it as Project Cadmus. But we're not talking about clones, but 
Basically, what if Superman dies and doesn't come back? What would the government do to make us feel like he was still there? Some really cool ideas, some great characterizations, and one of the best first issues I've ever read from Steve Orlando, who usually deals with these crazy, mind-boggling concepts. There's a little bit of that here, but this is an incredibly accessible book. It's a different spin on a familiar story, but once it takes that spin away from just the death and return of Superman um, resemblance, it goes into its own territory and finds its own unique voice, and I found it to be rather strong. Project, project, patron number one, here from Aftershock. Let's talk about Vault. Because a book I really want to highlight is Hollow Heart. Hollow Heart number two, holy freaking cow. So last night I sat down and I reread issue number one in preparation for issue number two. This issue blew me away. This is haunting. It is profound. It is, it is poignant. It is filled with the tragic and beautiful, hopeful despair that I think cap like completely captures like humanity. Like you could you could say that the exp the human experience is one of hopeful despair. That's what I get from this book. This book is about identity. This book is about this book is about so much. It's about friendship. It's about doing what's right. It's about putting others in in front of you. It's about how putting others in front of you is sometimes something that you're doing for yourself. There's so much about this book. It is freaking haunting. The basic premise is this. So there's this thing called L, a, a person, if you will. It's made up out of all different, it's like a Frankenstein monster. There's a bunch of different body parts from different people all put together to make this one entity in like the, this mech suit, right? And and he's trapped. He's, he's, he's tethered to this place and he just wants to escape. And he's just filled with pain. And he just wants to end it all. And he has somebody who works at this place kind of befriend him and kind of understand what he's going through or at least attempt to understand and then try to be his friend. And they, this book is so painful to read. And I mean that in the most positive way, meaning that it's painful that we experience these emotions. But it does. And in a very raw and haunting way, in a very beautiful way, um, Paul Allure, Paul Tucker, and everybody else at Vault has really tackled that and done a masterful job. Hollow Heart number two, definitely worth it. Engine Ward number nine is here. We're nearing the end of the series. Only three more left, and it's really starting to ramp up, and I'm digging it. I didn't get our cover A's, but that's okay. It's okay. That, that Hickman cover's dope, too. Um, but I can't wait to get my cover A because they all look the same, you whatever. Anyway, the 12 celestial beings that are represented by the different Zodiac, you know, they're like the ruling class of this world. They've been holding down this, this population, uh, keeping them from, like, having access to water and freedom, things like that. Um, and then they find hope. And now that hope is getting crushed. And this story is just ramping up. It's becoming more and more intricate. I really like the structure of the narrative. They've been doing this bit where they really start revealing in this one when you already kind of picked up on it. But it's kind of narrated by someone in the future talking about the past story. Um, and it gives you little hints and clues here and there. But it actually just really works so well with what's going on in the main story. Engine Ward number 9 nearing its end and definitely something super, super cool. Um, Vampire the, the Masquerade number 7. Lost. Lost. This is the start of the new arc. I thought it was the last one. That's how lost I am. I think I may have skipped a book. Also, I'm not familiar with the worlds of Vampire the Masquerade, but at this point, I need to reread it all because I can't really comment much on this book because I'm just lost throughout it, okay? And I know people that really like this book, but most of them really like Vampire the Masquerade. So I'm going to sit down one day and reread them all in order and get caught up, hopefully before issue eight comes out. Um, but one thing I can say is that those covers are freaking fire. So I read one of these Sumerian books, a new one started, Iron Shadows in the Moon. This is a blaze doing the Robert E. Howard Conan stuff. Um, they can't call it Conan because Marvel has the rights to do that. However, they can still tell these stories. They just can't call it Conan. Um, so everybody's been telling me these are really good. So I wanted to check it out. It is really, this one's really good. Now, I think they're all done by different creators. This is Virginie Augustin. Yeah, writer and artist. I really liked it. It's got a, it's got like an old school approach, but like it doesn't feel like weighted down or bogged down by like heavy dialogue that's like stilted and stiff. Um, it actually flows really well. Um, 
they're allegedly the uncensored Conan books, just meaning that they're definitely more violent and definitely more sexy, I would say. But I loved the art. I loved the layouts. I loved the script. I love it was the way it was presented. I don't read the Marvel Conan, but I may start reading these Sumerians from Ablaze. Y'all, those are pretty good. I think I'm going to jump into the Frost Giant's Daughters. I got those over there. Casual Fling is here from AWA Upshot. I have said that this is like the best episode of Red Shoe Diaries you've ever watched. And I mean that. But at the same time, it's not like gratuitous, okay? This is an emotional story. It's about a woman who is overly burdened, overly stressed. She makes a mistake and she sleeps on her husband. She sleeps around. You know, she has a casual fling one night. Casual fling. She has... She, she, you know, she sleeps with another dude one night, but the dude videotapes it. He's wearing a mask. Now he's like, he's like, he's like blackmailing her or whatever. So now she's going through all this stuff and it actually does a great job of not being very judgmental on her characters in the story are, but the book itself is not presenting it in that way. It's not a morality tale. It's just a great, like, unnerving thriller um, that I'm really digging. It's only four issues. This is issue three, so it's the penultimate issue. Um, but I love it. It's got great artwork. It gets the story across. The dialogue is spot on. The characters react exactly how I anticipate and expect that they should, but at the same time not being overly predictable. Um... I really like this. It's got real human emotion, real human voices, um, in a really messed up situation. And you learn more about this creepy mask dude and what his actual intentions and motivations are in issue number three. And I cannot wait till the end because I don't think it's going to end good for anybody, y'all, because that's not how these things go. There you go. The best written episode of Red Shoe Diaries you ever read. Casual Fling, if, <laughs> issue number three. The Resistance Uprisings here with issue number one. I have been so bored with the resistance it's almost to me like j michael straczynski trying to reboot his rising stars idea for a new generation um it's got some differences but at the same time it's just dull it's just boring it's not exciting um cp smith coming in on the artwork with snakebite cortez the artwork is really great in this issue but the story is just there's still once again just too many too many pieces too many things going on that i just don't care about too much dialogue, waiting it all down. I'm lost. I don't care. It's boring. It's dull. Y'all, I don't want to do it, but I think I'm done. I just don't know if I can read another Resistance. And the thing is, I get AWA books incredibly early. So there's no excuse other than I just don't dig it. I am done wasting my time on the Resistance. I do not like it. If you are on the fence about the Resistance and you're hoping that Volume 2 is going to like turn the page... I don't think so, homie. Uh, Dead Dog's Bite number two. So Dead Dog's Bite number one, I remember reading it and liking it, but not quite gelling with it. So I reread it last night. I appreciated it a lot more. Tyler Boss, the amazing artwork, great setup to the story. So now I've read issue number two and I love it. It's about this, it's about this young woman who has lost her best friend. Her best friend has gone missing and the town's been looking for her, but they're not having any luck. So she's starting her own investigation. She's unraveling um, secrets within this town. Um, the way it's presented is in a very great way. Tyler Boss has a great sense of flow and composition and panel design. Um, I love the look and color and the lettering of the book. It's a really great book with great pacing. Um, and there's a narrator in the book, which at first, in the first issue, really took me by surprise and threw me off. But I really love it because he shows up at the beginning and the end and he like sets you up with a story and it's kind of humorous and cool. And there's this whole thing about this small town with the, with a peppermint patty. It's got very much some vibes of Twin Peaks a little bit um, without focusing too much on some of the other characters, but really highlighting in on one. Um, but it's got that Twin Peaks vibe and I'm really digging it. So rereading issue number one and then reading two really sold me. Dead Dog's Bite, issue number two, out this week. Then we got Fear Case, issue number three, a penultimate issue, because I believe we only have one more, and the story really gears up and, and gets up there. I'm loving it. It's about these Secret Service agents, and they've been tasked to, to, to go on the Fear Case, and there's this black case that people have been passing around, allegedly for millennia, and if you get it, kind of like in a ring type way, you got like three days to pass it on to somebody, or it's going to wind up in the hands of someone that you love, and you should never, ever open it. Um, so it's about these secret agents who are like looking at like into this, this case because all the rookies apparently have to do this case for a year because it's the unsolvable case. Um, but it can also bring about obsession 
And that's what really starts happening here in issue number three. I like it. I think Tyler and Hillary Jenkins' artwork is not going to be for everybody. It's the artist of Grass Kings as well as uh, writing. Matt Kent was the writer of that one as well. He's the writer of this one. Um, and Tyler Jenkins was the artist on King of Nowhere. I really like the art. I think it really fits the tone um, appropriate for the story. Fear Case number three, I loved it. From Scout, we got the Impure number one. This is part of the non-stop line, meaning we got an issue number one and then a trade at a later date. But you can pick up the issue and see if it's something you want to get into. First thing I want to say is that the artwork in this book, Hannes Ratke, or Ratke is freaking awesome. The artwork, the coloring by Ralph Singh, holy crap. Ralph Singh is also the writer. The writing's pretty good too. It's about like this, uh, I'm trying to remember, it's, it's, it's got a, definitely science fiction. The artwork was what really sold me. The story itself is pretty decent. It's about these... Uh, it's about these two, they're kind of like brother-sister. I don't know if they're like, like they're biological brother-sister, but they wind up on two opposing sides of this like freedom fighters versus the, the oppressor, that typical type thing. But the artwork, the way it flowed, it was really, really solid. And I really like this cover. This is the exclusive cover that you can find on the website for Scout Comics or, or at shops that order directly from Scout. That cover's fire. That was pretty good. Speaking of Scout, we got Sam and his talking gun. Issue number two. Issue number one came out a while ago. Kind of forgot about it, but I jumped into issue number two with no preparation. Didn't get to reread one, um, but still loved it. At this point, Sam has been captured. He's got a talking gun. Is this dog actually? Is this gun actually talking to him, or is it just in his head? I don't know. That's up to you. However, this dude at least thinks that his gun's talking to him, and he's a badass assassin. In this one, they got him captured and away from his gun. That don't make him happy. And then it also gives us some backstory about who he is, his family, his circumstances, and how he came to be Sam and his talking gun. I like this a lot. I thought issue one was strong, or at least I remember thinking it was strong. Issue two, <clears throat> pretty strong as well. Also, if you are at a shop which has Scout Comics, Check this one out. Create a comic. It's from the Scoot line, which is their all ages line. Color, write, and draw your own book. This is perfect for children that want to get into it. They have the stuff where you can they have these blank pages so kids can do their art or you if you want to. Then they give you a story that's pretty decent. It's like a take on Batman and Robin with cutesy little characters. And so, you know, kids can draw on them. Then they can actually write their own book because they got word balloons there. And they can, this could inspire some creative energy. Okay. Um, this could inspire some creative energy um, from your kids if you want them to get into something like that. Then you have these unfinished pages where they can do their own artwork. It's pretty neat. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Don't usually do uh, Xenoscope stuff, but Grim Tales of Terror Quarterly presenting H.H. Holmes. We're talking about this because it's written by Jay Sandlin, my homie, my buddy. So full disclosure, Jay Sandlin is a homie of mine. Um, he's the writer of Over the Ropes, Hellfighter Quinn. He's a super cool cat, and I'm definitely going to respect and acknowledge everything that he does. I love that cover. Um, it's a $5.99 book that's probably some, or it's an $8.99 book. Never mind. It's an $8.99 book, but it's got a lot of pages to it. But it's a nice, simple horror story, kind of in the veins of Sherlock Holmes, but a very inverted sense of Sherlock Holmes. So if you're into Xenoscope stuff in particular, I recommend that you check it out. The artwork for me doesn't quite carry over the horrific nature of the story. It could have been done in a little bit more of an impactful way, but the story is there. H.H. Holmes, I really liked it, and maybe I should check out more Xenoscope stuff. What do you know? What do y'all think? Let me know in the comments down below. And from Heavy Metal, we've got The Rise. I'm so excited for this because it's written by George C. Romero, son of George A. Romero. Um... It's his son or grandson. It's one of them. Wouldn't it be crazy if George A. Romero's son is George B. Romero and then his grandson is George C. Romero? So then you would have to name your kid George D. Romero, male or female, right? Anyway, The Rise is uh, promising to tell us the story of how the zombie apocalypse started in the Romero world. Now, that's not necessarily something I felt like we ever needed to know. But I am excited for this book. The artwork is great. This was originally serialized, I believe, in pages of heavy metal and then brought to us in comic book form. The artwork is great. They got this great black, white, and red um, sense to it. Um, sense to it. I mean, they, they color it in, in black, white, and red. It's monochromatic. But I really, really like it. The idea, though, of knowing what causes the zombie apocalypse in the Romero zombieverse isn't appealing to me, and what they're doing isn't appealing to me either. I appreciate the mystery, and if they're going to reveal the mystery, I don't want it to seem as mundane as this actually is. 
which I don't want to spoil it for people that are going to get into it, but this feels kind of mundane, cliche, typical. Like, we just, we don't need the explanation. Let's just say it was a satellite coming back from Venus or something like that. The artwork was great. I'm going to continue to pick it up, though, because I'm that hardcore of a Romero fan. So that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. Pick of the week was The Silver Coin, a great horror anthology. First episode, first issue done by Chip Zdarsky. Michael Walsh, though, is going to be the writer, I mean, the artist on all of them, I believe. Man, it's been difficult to speak today. I don't know why. Anyway, thank you so much for checking out the video. What are you reading? What are you digging? What's your pick of the week? Let us know in the comments down below. Um, I've been Rockin' Robbie Bills. Please be sure to like, share, subscribe, click the notification bell, and all that jazz. And join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. And Michael Nichols, Tomorrow Cinema Station. Thank you so much for supporting us continually over at patreon.com slash PCP. We really do appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. You are worth it. Anyway, thank you so much for checking out the video. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.